Hey, I'm Chris, and this is my recap of Origins 2018. So in this recap, I'm going to talk about the new games I played, I'm going to talk about the convention in general, and then I'm going to talk about my personal experience with pitching my own game designs. Uh, in the show notes below, those things are timestamped, so if you want to skip to one or the other, or not watch one of them, or whatever you want to do, you can skip around on that. Okay, let's get into the new games I played. I played Holding On, The Troubled Life of Billy Kerr. This is an upcoming game. It's not out yet, but I played, uh, I think, basically finished prototype of the game. Uh, it's a cooperative game where you play, like, med medical administrators um, trying to care for a dying man named Billy Kerr, obviously. Um, and you're balancing kind of your time and energy between giving immediate medical care to keep him from dying and also listening to him to try to, like, find out more about his life. Um, it's an interesting game. I only played the first chapter out of a 10 chapter kind of campaign thing. Um, and right off the bat, it wasn't as sad as I thought it was going to be. Um, obviously it deals with heavy themes, death and dying. Um, and I think the game probably will get sadder as you go on, especially as you like get to know this character more and more. Um, but the first playthrough wasn't like a super depressing downer thing. Um, mechanically, I was pretty surprised. I really liked the game mechanically, and I normally am not a huge fan of co-op games. Um, it had the right level of mechanics where I felt like I was playing a game and not just doing some interactive fiction thing, um, but not so much that it got in the way of still telling an interesting story in an interesting way. It has a really good thing that I like a lot, where in a four-player game you have like a head nurse, and you assign people. Different cards come out, and they have options on the cards. You assign p different people that you're playing with to different cards so you get control of kind of who goes where but that person then gets to lead what they do there so maybe you sent them there because you wanted them to give medical aid but they choose instead to talk to him and get more information out of him stuff like that which really helps with the quarterbacking thing and gives agency to all players which is great um it also is a the the two guys that designed it are both irish and it is a specifically irish story um which is I liked a lot and is really cool um, because being from North America, um, I don't, you know, it's a, it's it's telling a, a personal story about a thing that's very common to people. I, I am thinking, well, I'm not going to say anything about it aside from it's an Irish story. It's a thing that took place in Ireland. Um, and so that's really interesting to kind of get a different, not American perspective on stuff was cool. I played Gaunt Sean Clever. Um, I talked more about this in the Kinnerspiel des Jahres video I did a couple weeks back, which is linked in the description below if you want more information on it, do that. But um, just to say, I still like this game a lot. It's a really solid roll and write game that's kind of like engine activation where everybody has the same sheet, so everybody has the same potential for combos, but it's kind of how you choose to place the dice to activate those combos in what order um, dictates how well you do in the game. Um, I like it. Uh, I might be getting better at it. I don't know. I've played it like five or six times now. Uh, it's still, and I think maybe probably will always be that like one roll away where it's like, I just need a one more die and I would have done really, really good. Um, but yeah, solid game. Reef uh, from Next Move Games. This is kind of the follow up to Azul. Plan B made a new imprint called Next Move that they are doing abstract, beautiful, simple games in. So Reef is the second game in that line. Um, this is a kind of pattern recognition game where you are placing little pieces of coral reefs in different colors on your player board, and then you are trying to create different patterns with them to score points off of cards. Um, this is a game I thought I was just going to love. Like, I thought, like, it's dumb, but I was like, well, this is going to be my favorite game. Like, this seems perfect. So my expectations were certainly too high because, spoiler, it is not my literal favorite game. But I still think I liked it a lot. I need to play it some more to figure out how much I liked it a lot because, again, when you have expectations that something's going to be the best thing that's ever made and it's just one of the really good things that's made, it's hard to then gauge that. At least for me it is. It was quite a bit thinkier than I was expecting. I always felt like I needed to be four turns ahead and planning ahead, so it was a lot to keep in my brain. Now, it's not necessary to play the game that way. You could totally play it very simply you know, it's it's very similar to Azul in that way. Where Azul, you can just kind of, each turn, you go like, yeah, I do this, and it works fine. You're not going to win, probably, but it works fine. Or you can always be a couple turns ahead going, I know that person's going to take that tile. That person's going to take that tile. That'll put this in the middle of their foot, you know? So it, it is that interesting depth of strategy that happens where it's just like, 
on the one level, it can be played and enjoyed totally casually, totally simply. On the other level, there is a good amount of game and thinking that can go into it. Um, so yeah, I liked it. Uh, yeah. The Mind, like Gonshan Clever, I did a Spiel video um, that's linked below where I went more in depth in The Mind, but suffice it to say, I still really like The Mind. It does this crazy empathy magic trick that you're somehow it works. Where So The Mind is a game where all you have to do, you get dealt cards, and you and your group of people have to put them in order from 1 to 100, right? So everybody will have like two cards, and I'll have a 17 and a 49. And it's like, when do I play those? Um, and that's it. Like, pretty much it. There's a little bit more, but pretty much it. Um, and you can't talk. You can't have any, like, predetermined signals or anything like that. So it's just kind of this, like, weird emergent magic trick that somehow works. Um, I saw a lot of people playing it, which was really cool uh, to see different play styles, how fast different groups play, kind of the different nonverbal, non-cheating uh, verbal or nonverbal communication going on. It was really interesting. I did see a group going like, hmm, 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 which is like, well, that's cheating. They were having a good time at it though, so I didn't like correct them because why would, it's just like, hey, you guys stop enjoying this game in the way you want to be enjoying this game. But uh, also don't do that. The game's more interesting if you don't. Um, so yeah, it's a good game. I, it's very weird. It's very weird that it's as good as it is because it's so in description, almost not a game, but yeah. I played Kashgar, Merchants of the Silk Road. Um, this was a Cosmos game from a year or two ago that had a ton of text, so it was not an easy import. You had to sleeve cards and put stickers and all that stuff on them um, that Grail Games is now bringing over. Um, my friend Adam described this pretty aptly as like a deck builder where everything is open. So you have three different card rows, right? You have three different columns of cards, and whenever you get a new card, like in a deck builder, you put that at the back of that cards column and so you play them off the front so it's like if that's three back I know I have to play these three cards in front of it in order to use that card I want so you're building these like little engines that do different things but you always can kind of see where all of your cards are so there's no like shuffling luck happening aside from the cards that are coming out that you are then um, able to draft so um, it was really interesting I did terribly at it it was one of those games that I just completely sucked out, sucked at, and then was like, huh, I'm very interested to play this game some more so I can figure out how to be good at it. So yeah, really good. Welcome To is a new roll and write that Deepwater Games is bringing over. Um, this is a roll and write, it's actually flipping cards and writing, but I count them all in the same roll and write category. Um, in it, you are basically trying to fill out a suburbs. You're writing numbers in different houses on blocks, and then you're using kind of different special actions in order to optimize writing those numbers. You have to write them in numerical order um, from 1 to 15. They don't have to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but they have to be like 1, 3, 8, 9, 10, right? Like, the number to the right has to be higher. Um, I really, really liked it. I think I might like it more than Gonshan Clever. Um, it is up there. It I haven't played it enough, but it might be up there with Avenue for my favorite roll and write game, which Avenue weirdly is a flip and write game, not a roll and write. So I don't think it's because of that, but maybe, maybe I just like flipping cards and writing things. Um, it's a really solid game. I liked it a lot. It's one of those games where the rules explanation is a little bit tough. Like it's like, what, what? Cause there's a lot of different actions. Once you actually get into it and play a round or two, it's really simple, but it is a little bit of like more of a, a hump to get over than a lot of roll and write games, just in case your group uh, has an attention span of 45 seconds and will light the house on fire if you teach them rules. The convention overview section begins now. Um, so Origins continues to be one of my absolute favorite um, board game conventions. It is big enough that everything's there. There's tons of stuff to do and see. There are tons of publishers there. There's new games coming out. There's stuff that being demoed. It's really exciting. Um, but it's also small enough that you can like see the people you want to see and get around really easily and not get completely lost in the convention center like I do at Gen Con every year. Um, so it's great. It's also probably the best convention for food, at least the best one I've been to. It's it's um, There's a place called North Market that's like a lot of little different food stands that are really, really good. Um, there's really great food just across the street. So it's like everything's walkable and you can actually get like really good food. You're not stuck eating like nachos for the eighth day in a row at the convention. Um, there, I think they need more open game. They need better marked open gaming. So they had an actual open gaming section this year, but it was on a different floor and it stuck away and nobody knew about it. And I never like like leaving 
the kind of energy of the convention to like go to a room and play games. So that's not great. They have badges that you can buy for 20 bucks where you can like go into a specific gaming section and play from their library. But it's like, I don't care about the library games. And like, I want to be able to play with all of my friends, not just ones that spent 20 bucks. Um, and it's a thing that's never been an issue for me because there's a lot of reserved tables after hours but most of them don't get used. It's like, there'll be a Dragon Ball Z card game tournament, they've got 50 tables, and they're only using 20 of them, right? So you can use those tables, unless somebody kicks you off of them. But that is a thing that I was thinking about, because I was hearing people going like, man, there's just not enough open gaming. And I was going, what are you talking about? There's tons. But I realized, like, I'm technically breaking rules, and people don't like feeling like they're breaking rules, and people, if it's your first convention, you certainly don't feel like it's okay to break rules, or you'll get in trouble or something. Um, so... I think as conventions are moving forward, I think PAX is going to have a big influence on this. Um, there, there have been, you know, like Board Game Geek Con is a very much playing games convention. Dice Tower Con is a very much playing games convention. But I think PAX is kind of becoming very popular. And I think conventions moving forward will just need to have very large sections that are very clearly for open gaming. That's what they're for. They're on the convention floor. Because um, that's a thing a lot of people want. And I think you got to give the people what they want. So um, as far as like designing, pitching, stuff like that goes at this convention, I wasn't doing a ton of pitching. I was mainly trying to play test some new stuff and then kind of like finish off some old stuff. So I had some meetings and things like that. Um, first up, Darwinauts, which is a game that I designed years ago that I've been working on forever, uh, is going to be coming out from Green Couch Games soon. Um, and I got a chance to demo um, the prototype copy at their booth, which was really cool and really exciting. So I've been working on this game for so long, I've kind of like gotten bogged down with it. So like getting to put it in front of new people and see them enjoy that um, was really awesome. Um, and it's also just really exciting for this game to be coming out because it's the game that I've worked on by far the longest of any of my games. So the fact that it's coming out is really exciting. Um, my one pitch I set up uh, was for kind of uh, one of my bucket list publishers that I really, really, really want to work with and I've wanted to work with for some time now. Um, I think that they're a perfect fit for kind of my type of game. Um, so I pitched them an abstract game that they liked. It went well. Um, I'm going to show it to them again at Gen Con with some changes and stuff like that. But um, all in all, very exciting, uh, really good stuff there. I got the green light from a publisher I've been working with, designing, I've been designing a game with them and for them for a while. Um, so we got to kind of the end of that road and they went like, yep, it's done, not done. Yep, the design is done, it's now in development. Um, so that's very, very exciting. That should be coming out sometime next year. I can't talk about what it is yet. Um, and I got in a play test for a co-design that I've been trying to work on. And we've been, we don't live locally, so, or local to each other. Um, so we've been talking about it um, for some time, trying to like go back and forth with ideas. And I put together this huge prototype. I did way more work than I normally would have done before I like play tested because I wanted to get it all out and play test with them. And we play tested it and it totally sucked. It totally crashed and burned. Uh, so we're not, we're abandoning most of it. We're going back to kind of the core uh, that uh, we talked about. So that was frustrating, but also like you have to have stuff like that in order to have progress on a game. So we're still sticking with it. So that was all my playtest stuff. That's how my game designs are doing. Yeah. So thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Make sure you follow me on social media. I'm at Chris Bryan Games on Instagram and Twitter. I try to do board game news every single week. I'm not doing it next week because I'm going to be in Canada. But um, if you want to stay up to date on the latest and greatest things happening in board games, this is a great way to do that. Um, also, I've got a Patreon linked below. Uh, if you like what I do and want to see more of it, um, supporting me is a great way to show me that. And there are um, special exclusive videos and things that you can get access to by backing me there. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in.